One of the crazy things about mushrooms is that they produce 50 million tons of spores every year and can help to trigger the formation of rain and snow. Can we start at the very beginning? Fungi are a kingdom of life. You can think of them as ecosystem engineers. Help us understand how they're important. There's a chemical from shiitake mushrooms which is used very widely for treating cancer. Nobody told me anything about this. The links between soil health and gut health are just so obvious. Talking about all these chemicals in fungi, there's one that's hitting the headlines called ET. And Welcome to Zoe, Science and Nutrition, where world-leading scientists explain how their research can improve your health. I'm your host, Jonathan Wolf, founder and CEO of Zoe. Today, we dive into the captivating world of fungi and mushrooms and learn about the surprising reasons why they're so important for us. Fungi expert Dr. Merlin Sheldrake and my scientific co-founder at Zoe, Professor Tim Spector, take us on a psychedelic tour of mushrooms, why they're a promising treatment for debilitating mental health conditions like depression. We'll also hear how the chemicals in mushrooms might be protecting us from other diseases. And of course, why eating more mushrooms is beneficial for our health. Merlin is a biologist and the author of the best-selling book, Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our World. And Tim is one of the world's top 100 most cited scientists and a professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College London. Merlin and Tim, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. <laughs> Tim's doing this like extra long <laughs> pause just to throw me off. So <laughs> I'm really excited about this one um, because I really enjoyed uh, the book. And those of you who are on video can actually see the new version of it. It has these amazing pictures in it, which uh, when I read it, it didn't have the pictures. And now suddenly it all makes way more sense. So I think that is the ultimate coffee book uh, book for people who love like really getting this vision into something you haven't seen before. But at this point, no one probably has any idea what we're talking about. So what I'd like to do is start with a tradition we have here, Merlin, which is a quick fire round of questions. Are you up for that? Sounds good to me. So we, we have very strict rules, which are always tough for scientists. You can say yes or no, or if you absolutely have to, you can give us a sentence. You willing to give it a go? I'll try. All right. I'm going to have three for Merlin to start with. Are mushrooms and fungi a kind of plant? No. If there were no fungi, would we be alive today? No. Do plants rely on fungi as much as we rely on gut bacteria? At least as much. Brilliant. Well, we're going to go into that in a bit more detail. Now, Tim, do all mushrooms have the same health benefits? No, but they're all good. <laughs> Are dried mushrooms as good for our health as fresh mushrooms? Usually and sometimes more. And finally, do psychedelic mushrooms have the potential to revolutionize medicine? Absolutely. All right, final question. And Merlin, you're allowed more than just yes or no. So give us a sentence or two. What's the most surprising thing about fungi that you found in your studies? It's very hard to answer that because there are so many surprising things. I'll choose one. Um, that the fungal networks in a teaspoon of soil could stretch from anywhere from 100 meters to 10 kilometers. Hi, I hope you're learning a lot from this fantastic mushroom chat with Tim and Merlin. As it turns out, 63% of people who watch this podcast haven't hit the subscribe button and 11% haven't pressed the bell to turn notifications on. So if you've ever enjoyed this podcast, please do hit the subscribe button and turn notifications on. Doing us this small favor will really help us to reach more people with life-changing health information. And that's why we do this show every week and put in all this hard work. Thank you, and on with the show. Merlin, can we start at the very beginning? Um, because I think most people here, like me, didn't know what a fungi was. What are fungi, and are they the same as mushrooms? Fungi are a kingdom of life, so that's as broad a category as animals or plants. So there's lots of ways to be a fungus, just like there's lots of ways to be an animal, there's lots of ways to be a plant. Um, but they're not plants, and they're not animals. Um, mushrooms are the reproductive structures of a small group 
of, well, a large group, but a small, proportionally small group um, of fungi. So mushrooms are the places where fungi produce spores, which help them disperse themselves over potentially large distances. So when we think of mushrooms, we're just thinking of a small part uh, of the overall life of a fungus, which is usually in the form of a network. Most fungi live most of their lives as networks of branching, fusing cells called mycelial networks. And so that means I should think about mushrooms a bit like a fruit. So it's like a, a tomato or a pear within this thing that isn't a plant. It's analogous to the fruit of a plant, um, except that the tree, say the apple tree that produced the apples, is underground. And the mushrooms you see usually are sticking up through the ground. Um, and you're not able to see the rest of the tree. Why aren't they a plant? Because it feels like, you know, they're not an animal so my, and then they're not a bacteria. So my very simple view of the world, they're a plant, aren't they? <laughs> I think perhaps the most important difference is that plants, on the whole, uh, photosynthesize. So they produce energy from the light coming from the sun and from carbon dioxide in the air. And it's a really fundamental process on the planet, photosynthesis. Uh, it's kind of like they're eating air and eating light um, to produce the energy they need to grow and do the things they do. Fungi don't photosynthesize. So like us, as animals, we have to find food in the world ready-made, as it were, and put it inside us. Fungi have to find food in the world um, and consume it. Uh, they can't make their own um, energy. Like, uh, can't, they can't make their own energy containing carbon compounds like plants do. They would steal the energy from something else that's made it. So that's fascinating. So they don't have the ability to photosynthesize. They can't take the, the energy from, from the sun. But they can't just walk around, right, like an animal or even, I think, like a bacteria that's sort of free. Does that tie into what you're talking about before, about you know, these incredible number of um, sort of roots that you were describing? Yes. So they grow into networks, mycelial networks. Um, and what these networks allow them to do is, uh, whereas animals tend to find food in the world and put it inside their bodies, fungi put their body inside their food. Which sounds disgusting. Well, I mean, not <laughs> disgusting if you're a fungus. <laughs> um, and the way that they do this is by growing these networks, um, which allow them to bury themselves, insinuate themselves within their food source. Um, because they're highly branched, they can um, make contact with as much of their surroundings as possible, which they then digest by releasing enzymes and uh, other digestive compounds, which allow them to break down their surroundings and absorb those nutrients into the networks. Nobody told me anything about this when I studied my like school biology. I don't feel like people are constantly talking to me about fungi. Do they matter? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm bound to say yes. Um, but I do believe uh, that they really do matter, uh, and I'm not alone. Um, one of the things that they're able to do, remember this is a big um, group of organisms, a kingdom of life, um, but on the whole, fungi are metabolically ingenious. They're chemical wizards. They can produce all sorts of fascinating chemicals um, that allow them to interact with the world in strange and, and remarkable ways. So what this allows them to do is to... Um, play really important roles in the biosphere. Uh, for example, by decomposing wood. If all the wood that plants produced um, piled up, unrotted, then we'd be buried kilometers deep in, uh, in unrotted forests. Of course, we wouldn't exist um, uh, in that situation, but you get, the, you get the picture. So, And you need the fungi in order to break down the wood? So wood wouldn't decompose if it wasn't for the activity of fungi, which are able to break down the wood um, by producing... Um, uh, an arsenal of, uh, of chemicals that, and um, enzymes that allow them to do so. But they aren't just powerful decomposers. They also play really important roles in um, making life on land possible. So all plants, for example, depend on fungi, on um, symbiotic fungi that live in them or on them in order to survive. Um, plants would not have made it out of the water and onto the land about 500 million years ago were it not for the fungi that they formed relationships with. So they're symbionts, um, they're decomposers, um, and through all this activity, they play a part in um, regulating the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, because when they decompose things, they release carbon dioxide. When they support plant life, they help pull down carbon dioxide um, into um, stable forms in the soil. They also make soil um, by uh, decomposing um, organisms. You can think about soil as the kind of the guts of the planet, 
um, if you like. I tend to, I often think about it like that. And, and fungi are key players in, in the life of that um, um, gut system, if you like, in the soil. They hold soil together. They form a sticky living seam that holds soil together. If you take away the fungi, the soil will wash away. Um, they play all sorts of roles like this. You can think of them as uh, ecosystem engineers. Can I touch for a minute, because you mentioned this word symbiosis, which definitely brings me back to like 15-year-old biology. Um, and I feel like it's really interesting because we talk a lot about sort of gut bacteria and this realization, and we have Tim here, about how important they are for us and that they weren't all, these bacteria aren't all our enemies, but actually it seems clear now that there's a lot of ways in which um, you know, the human body and bacteria actually fit together. I think there's something analogous that you're talking about between fungi and plants, but you sort of skipped over it a bit fast. Could, could you help to understand like, how essential are fungi for plants and how does that, how does that fit together? Yeah, so symbiosis just means living together, right? There's lots of ways to live together, like we know as humans. Um, there are lots of kinds of relationship that we can form. Um, uh, some of these are healthier relationships than others. Some are more productive, constructive relationships than others. And some can be really problematic. Um, it's like that um, in the living world at large as well. So fungi form um, relationships with plants um, perhaps in the most important way, by living in and around plant roots, extending their webs, their exploratory webs into the soil and foraging for nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus, which they're able to find more easily than plants can. They transport this nitrogen and phosphorus back to the roots and they exchange it with plants for sugars and fats that the plants have produced in photosynthesis. So they have a trading relationship with plants. Trading meaning they're giving plants something good and the plants are giving them something, something back. Good. Yeah. They, on the whole, both are benefiting from this association. It's what you might call a mutualism. Um, but it's based on the exchange of resources. So the plant's getting something it can't so easily get by itself. The fungus is getting something it can't so easily get by itself. And together, they're able to extend their reach and do things that neither could do alone. The links between soil health and gut health are just so obvious. And that you know, and anyway, the life of the planet and you know, the health, healthy human is also deeply interlinked. And it's interesting that the ratio of fungi to microbes in soil is actually a really good indicator of the health of the soil. And in areas where it's the, there are less fungi networks, then that soil isn't as nutritious, or it, it's hard to grow things. So in a way, that's just like humans that have you know lost diversity of our microbes the only uh we know there are fungi in in the human gut and we we estimating that about eight percent or so of our microbes are f fungal that's a bit of a guess because <clears throat> they're hard to um, sequence genetically and they're much larger than uh, the equivalent bacteria so we don't really know but we we used to think of them as harmful inside our guts and, you know, lots of clinics everywhere set up to eliminate gastric um, fungi like candida. And there's no real evidence that for most people they are harmful and a lot of evidence that they do play a really uh, protective, again, symbiotic role working with uh, the bacteria in this case to maximize the nutrition and reduce things like inflammation and keep the gut wall in structurally really sound and a real defense mechanism particularly for the immune system so we think fungi in the in the gut are really important for the immune system so it's really lovely to see these analogies these crossovers how you know they, yes they work with plants they also work with humans and it's a two-way you know um exchange mechanism that, that's really cool. Your research is about how fungi can engage with the environment, even though they don't have any, they, they don't have any brains, right? There's no, a fungi doesn't have a brain. Could you tell us in very simple words, like what you're doing and um, sort of, I, I, I guess, what it tells us? So I'm working with a, a research group and we're trying to understand the way that um, these symbiotic fungi that live with plants in and around their roots how these fungi are able to behave as networks? How are they able to live in a changing world, um, sensing their environment, sensing lots of things, sensing temperature, sensing uh, any number of chemicals, um, sensing uh, acidity, pressure, all sorts of things. Um, how are they able to sense all of these um, 
uh, these aspects of their environment, how are they able to integrate all of these different sensory data streams um, and, um, and decide in their way, decide on the right course of action at any one moment. We know very little about this. Um, and so we're looking inside these networks using microscopes and watching the flow patterns, like rivers of fluid moving through the network. Um, and sometimes like getting to a junction, going up one way and changing direction and going down the other um, branch of the junction. And uh, so it's really exciting work because there's a lot of looking involved. And when I read it, it reminded it remind me a bit of like these sort of science fiction movies where we experience some completely foreign creature that doesn't seem to have a, a brain or whatever, but actually turns out to be, you know, cleverer than us. And I definitely get a sense from you of some sort of awe that this thing is actually much smarter than you would have expected or we could imagine, despite the fact that it's sort of in invisible to us and doesn't have a brain. These things that we would classically think of as... Um, What's required to imagine that something has any intelligence or capability? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, you can one of these fungi might be uh, sprawled over tens of meters. It might be um, engaging with um, hundreds of thousands, millions of different plant root tips. It might be um, have very different uh, environmental situations in different parts of its network, managing um, un uncountable uh, number of trading decisions with these plants. Um, and constantly remodeling itself and, and readapting in these trading uh, relationships to changes in the situation uh, from moment to moment, from day to day, from season to season. Like, these are uh, non-trivial problems to solve. Um, and of course, they solve them in their way, and they've evolved over hundreds of millions of years to do this. Um, but yeah, that does boggle my mind. Has there been a significant human impact on um, on the fungi around the world and the way that it supports plants and the way that we're obviously very aware there is on trees? For sure. If we cut down a forest and the bodies of those plants were home to a whole load of fungal species that depend on those plants for, for somewhere to live um, and for symbionts to live with, for partners to live with, um, we cut down the forest, you've, you've destroyed the habitat for a whole load of fungi that no longer can live there. Um, you've also created habitat for a whole load of different types of fungi, right? Um, you might have fungi that thrive on rotting wood. So if a forest is killed by a, a disease um, and you have a lot of dying, dead, dying wood around, that will create habitat for a different group of fungi. So um, again, there's so many ways to be a fungus, it's, it's a little hard to, to generalize. But um, on the whole, yes, when we do um, uh, really huge scale industrialized agriculture, we are often damaging fungal communities by plowing. I was wondering about that, this like constant plowing and yeah. fertilizer. Does that, do you get the same density, I guess, of fungi in the way that we do modern agriculture as we would have done in um, historical approaches? No, you, you disrupt the fungal communities and you get lower fungal diversity and you get less um, healthy, less active um, groups of fungi in those places. Plants have evolved for hundreds of millions of years to do what they do in association with fungi. So some modern strains of plants, some modern crops, for example, a wheat variety, um, might have been bred to grow quickly when you feed it with loads of um, chemical phosphorus. Um, this is like giving it fertilizer. Yeah, giving it lots and lots of fertilizer. Um, and so that modern bread variety might not be so good at forming relationships with their you know, their companion fungi as um, a, a, a variety that has been um, grown by humans for, you know, for a long time um, before this chemical phosphorus started to be applied. So, um, so on the whole, we are... Um, we, if we're breeding this kind of plant, we're breeding quite spoiled plants. A spoiled plants with maybe not very good symbiotic manners. They're not so good at forming these associations. Um, and um, they might form quite dysfunctional relationships with the fungi that would otherwise be key parts of their lives. So you take away the phosphorus the plant needs, uh, the plant won't survive. And nor will it have fungal partners to uh, strike up a relationship with. I've sort of got this analogy now of plants almost being fed on their own version of ultra-processed food, right? So they grow really fast but in a way that isn't quite right. And then, of course, probably therefore ending up without some of the things that you know you would expect to see in a healthy plant, which we then go and eat. Am I stretching this too far? No, it's like if you, you, know, you suddenly feed any animal massively and it, it balloons up in size, it might have you know, more height and weight, but it, it's going to lack some of those nutrients and things that uh, its defense chemicals, its... Uh, its complexity and its interaction with the world is going to be different because all you're focusing on is the size of that 
that animal or that plant. They're lazy. You know, they just don't have to sit back, don't have to do much hard work. And the fertilizer just uh, is this massive growth hormone that just pushes them up. And it's so a bit like they've lost their own microbiome, only in this case, it's their fungi and it's spread out and dispersed rather than sort of sitting inside. Yeah, them. they don't care. They don't need it. I'm getting all the growth I need, you know. Um, what do I care? I don't, all these extra nutrients, they're just, uh, you know, icing on the cat. I don't need to worry about that. Let's not give the fungi as much and the fungi don't uh, return the favor. So I think that's partly it, but also, you know, the heavy plowing, the chemicals in the soil, all these things are, are disrupting these networks as well. So, And Merlin, presumably this is all unintentional, right? It's not that people 70 years ago or whatever we started this big um, growth in agriculture like, oh, we know all about the fungi and we're, we don't care. It's just that they were seeking to get more and more food. Nobody knew about any of this, I'm guessing. And this is another example of sort of an unintended byproduct because... We generally didn't realize how complicated the world was, and I think tended to think that there were very simple answers, and only now starting to realize there was much more complexity underneath. I think that's fair to say that that um, largely it's been driven through um, ignorance rather than through people being malicious. However, that wouldn't be something you could necessarily apply today, where you have powerful lobby groups for you know, for the chemical industry, for the uh, big machinery industries, for all of these different um, parts of the um, heavily commercialized agricultural world. Um, I don't think that um, all of those vested interests uh, and powerful lobbies are acting um, out of their concern for the soil. I think they're acting um, for yeah. a profit motive. Can I ask about um, herbicides and uh, glyphosate, for example, the commonest herbicide used? We don't really talk about its its effect on on uh, fungi and fungal networks. Do, is there any data on that? Is it resistant to it? Um, does it matter? I've read some studies that suggest that um, herbicides are damaging and disruptive to to mycorrhizal fungal networks. Um, I don't know what context they were studying those those studies took place in. I, I don't know how um, how much these herbicides affect decomposer fungi which are also important parts of the soil. Um, but certainly there's some evidence that they are disruptive. And of course they're disruptive in another way because they kill the plants, no, kill plants that fungi depend on. And you know, the whole lower diversity of plants in an area means lower diversity of fungi. Hi, I want to take a quick break with you from this fascinating mushroom conversation. Now, back in March last year, we created this podcast to uncover how the latest science can help all of us live longer and healthier lives. And over hundreds of hours of conversations with world-leading scientists, we've uncovered key insights that have the potential to help you improve your health. Now, if you don't have hundreds of hours to spare, not to worry. At the request of many of our listeners, our team has created an amazing guide summarizing the top 10 most impactful discoveries that you could apply to your life. And you can get it for free. Simply go to zoe.com slash free guide or click the link in the show notes. And please let me know what you think of it. Okay, back to the show. I'd love to talk now about the role of fungi and mushrooms in human health, and maybe it's starting with medicine, because I know, Tim, that you're quite excited about some of the new things that are, are coming along. And so could you maybe talk, Tim, talk to us about hallucinogenic or psychedelic mushrooms, which I was definitely brought up as something that my parents told me I should never do. And now you're talking about it as potentially real treatment for... Um, mental health issues. Yes. Well, mushrooms have been used medically for thousands of years in China, um, it's really since records began. And uh, there's a huge history there that, in a way, the West sort of forgot about and is, is recently re, you know, rediscovering. Um, the so-called magic mushrooms uh, in the West really seem to uh, come to light after a family um, were having a picnic in Green Park in the 17th century. Okay, keep going. And, and uh, they they were reported by, I think it was the Times, as going crazy and, and delirious and having to be sort of arrested by the police because they'd... Uh, Fits of giggles been, were mentioned. Uh, yes, uh, hysterical, and they couldn't be sort of you know, controlled. And this, this made the newspapers of the time. Uh, and it turned out they'd been foraging in Green Park and found these mushrooms. And that's that's really how... Uh, at least in the West, this idea that mushrooms had this um, 
this mood uh, changing effect. But some mushrooms, um, the some were called psychedelic or magic mushrooms, produce a substance called psilocybin, which is a very powerful uh, uh, chem- neurochemical in the brain, and it's very closely linked to uh, the drug LSD, um, lysergic acid. LSD was around in the 1960s, as, uh, and it, it had a brief time when it was thought to be useful therapeutically, and there were studies. You went to Johns Hopkins University, and uh, you were a student, and you enrolled in the LSD study, and they did a group of, of students there and um, found that it did have profound effects uh, on these on these students, generally positive. There were a small amount of them that got rather anxious symptoms, but most had very positive life and life changing type um, experiences. And, and I think Merlin, you actually rather more recently than the period you're talking about took part yourself in one of these LSD trials, I think, in, in the UK, if I remember rightly, from, from the book. That's right. In this, this resurgence of interest in, in psychedelics, which has taken place in the last 15 years or so. Um, and it was um, a study into the effects of LSD on the problem-solving abilities of scientists. So they got a lot of scientists, which I was recruited as a tea room in the tea room at the Department of Plant Sciences. I was working. There was a poster on the wall that said, uh, "Do you have a meaningful problem that needs solving?" Mm. <laughs> and I called this number, so I called the number because um, it seemed like I had many meaningful problems that needed <laughs> to be solved. I thought you could recruit more or less anyone that way if they were silly enough to call the number. Mm. Um, anyway, I was silly enough to call the number, and they said that this was a, a study involving um, scientists and giving them LSD to see if it changed the way that they uh, solved problems. So I thought I said, "Well, sign me up." And I went to the hospital. Um, and they give you a battery of tests, you know, of psychometric tests and questionnaires and, and so forth. And then you um, you lie in the hospital um, bed. They they very politely actually they made the hospital room less hospitally. They had hung um, hangings on the walls and they had mood lights and, and music. Um, so you didn't feel exactly like you were in a hospital, but it was quite a thin disguise, I'd say. <laughs> um, anyway, you, you, I lay there and, um, and, and, and had the uh, LSD and... Um, and uh, a, a remarkable experience it was. Did you solve your problem? <laughs> <laughs> Not in any straightforward way. <laughs> um, but um, I, what I did get, where um, I got new perspective on the problem. It felt like um, it felt like lots of very familiar parts of the problem landscape became unfamiliar again, and so I could kind of re, I could re-examine um, the situation. Um, and it felt like there were lots of really helpful insights. If there was not one one key solution, there were helpful insights that allowed me to um, to proceed um, in uh, in a way that felt fruitful. And how was the experience overall? Very positive. I had a great time. Um, it's um, they, they, I had to do these questionnaires questionnaires to you know to assess um, how you're feeling. Because one of the problems of doing this research. Now, as a scientist, so the scientists doing the study is that they're they're trying to be objective. You know, they're looking from outside, um, but they're looking at my subjective state and the subjective state of the other participants. Um, and it's hard to be objective about subjective things. Um, so they had these questionnaires. Um, one of the questionnaire questions um, I remember having to answer this question again and again was, um, "How do you rate your experience of infinity?" on a scale of one to ten and this question never ceased to amuse me uh, every time it came around every hour or so i would descend into even uh, more intense fits of giggles um and eventually pull some number out of the air but um this is not to make fun of the questionnaires as, as an approach it's just sometimes <laughs> these things can seem absurd um when you're in that um, it's supposed to mind. change your your concept of ego isn't it so that's that's one of the big things you it removes your ego so you can see everything more objectively this is what people who do this regularly and therapists say did you yeah it's something a, certain, like that? certainly um it becomes the boundaries of where you start and stop become um more confusing feels like you become more porous um it's less easy to distinguish uh, you from your environment um for me i felt like my mind became a much larger place it's like i um most uh, like on a day-to-day basis like i spend time in, in the garden of my mind but on in this experience it felt like 
um, I noticed there was a gate at the bottom of the garden leading to a path, le leading into a forest, like leading into a much bigger place, which was um, which was quite a, an amazing place to explore. And that's something actually I brought back with me from the experience. Um, it's, I find it helpful sometimes to, to remember that my mind is a, a bigger place than the room that I'm spending time, uh, my mental room that I might be spending time in at any given moment. And Tim, what does the latest science sort of show about so, this? Is this just an yes. excuse to let like fancy well, scientists be able to do LSD without getting sent to jail, or is there like something? Um, no, well, real I mean, here? you know, for thirty or forty years, LSD was seen as a bad drug. It's definitely, it, it, what I was brought up to, and believe. it got labelled, you know, as these bad trips and bad acid trips, and it, it you know, got labelled the same way as heroin and cocaine and. Uh, uh, crystal meths, etc., and it it turns out that was really a um, a blanket reaction to all drugs, and throughout what is actually therapeutically a very useful tool in psychiatry. And got to remember that there's been no new drugs in psychiatry for at least thirty years, and they've started to do um, uh, trial proper clinical trials with proper doses of psilocybin, which is easier to dose than just LSD, and shown remarkable benefits of people with uh, quite severe depression that have been resistant to medication, and also uh, some case of anxiety and depression, and also some um, psychosis as well. There's some encouraging signs that it can so reset the brain uh, through these chemicals and so actually changing some neural pathways inside the brain in in positive ways. Everyone in that area is super excited by it and there are many companies now looking at uh, biosimilar compounds uh, that, uh, you know, again, kind of crazy and thinking how fungi are producing these, these amazing compounds that we're now using as medications for mental health. It just, again illustrates how you know we need to be embracing nature and, and using all these things together so i think you know in five years we'll be seeing these th these these drugs uh, i was gonna say I, I think you were talking to me the other day about lots of other uses of um, mushrooms that people are investigating in medicine uh, there's quite a lot going on in cancer interesting in um and not as a main main treatment um there are some sort of test tube studies show that uh when you sort of dry these mushrooms and you put them in little uh, test tube plates, you can get immune benefits or, and you can get anti-cancer benefits. But often, the, most things can show that. So the proof is often in in uh, human studies. There aren't many of those, um, but there have been several. There's there was thirteen thousand elderly people with dementia who had given lots of mushrooms and um, reduced their dementia. Uh, outcomes after six years, um, thirty-six thousand Japanese given it, and should have reduced their risk of prostate cancer. Um, these are observational studies, not trials, so they're not the gold standard. Um, and lots of mouse studies showing that particularly things like button mushrooms or reishi mushrooms um, can reduce, can have sort of beneficial effects. And I think the most important is these cancer trials. So there are five small studies of, again, these uh, reishi uh, mushrooms, which show that if you give it in addition to chemotherapy, so this is adjuvant treatment, um, you get improvements in those cancer outcomes. And, uh, you know, this is, um, this was looked at independently by uh, the Cochrane Review, which is a, a generally uh, unbiased way of looking at it, saying, yes, you know, up to 50% improvement, the trials could be bigger, could be better. Yes, we need more of them. Um, reishi and turkey tails seem to be coming out as helping side effects of the drugs and helping them have a bigger immune impact. So I think this is where that field is going. Is that that's amazing? These have you know the hundreds of chemicals in these mushrooms and fungi are having these benefits on our immune systems that maybe help us respond better to these drugs. And I think this is again similar to what we see in, 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 the, in the human gut as well. And worth remembering also that the, um, 
fungal enthusiasm, as you said, Tim, is, is not equally distributed around the globe. And so um, in East Asian cultures, there's a, a maybe a kind of mycophilia, you might say, a, a more of an enthusiasm for things. Mycophilia is loving mushrooms, yeah, is that? Uh, okay. that yeah, I'm, I'm loving fungi, uh, fungus loving. Um, I'm slightly surprised you haven't come up with, uh, turned up with that on your T-shirt, Merlin. I'm disappointed now. Oh, I, 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 you have it on my chest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, so... Um, but but in but in Japan um, there are um, some there's a chemical from shiitake mushrooms which is used very widely um, in for for treating cancer uh, alongside more conventional cancer treatments and and also a compound from turkey tail which is used very widely in um, quite conventional medical contexts. Um, so um, yeah, so the, the research, the science is uh, is unequally distributed, and some of the reasons why those are not used so widely here is because it's not totally clear how they're working. Um, although it seems to be very clear that they work. Talking about all these chemicals in fungi, there's one that's sort of hitting the headlines at the moment called ET. And tell uh, me about ET, which makes me think of a famous 1980s movie. But n- yeah, he looks a little like a mushroom now. I think about it, but that's not I think where we're it's, going. Yeah, ergothionine is 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 a a compound produced um, uh, in in many fungi, particularly the what's called the the Bolletz family, which is like seps and, and porcini mushrooms, uh, quite high doses of it. And it's, it's been shown in a number of studies to have these uh, particularly powerful um, effects on the body, on the immune system. And interestingly, humans have adapted systems to actually uh, take this chemical and, and, and bring it into their bodies. So it's it's like a vitamin. And it's it's been, um, I think, wasn't it called a lot? Some marketing person called it the longevity vitamin. And uh, so it, it gets absorbed in our bodies and there's quite a lot of hype around it and you can now buy um, ET supplements and, uh, you, you know, there are people saying it has amazing powers. Uh, but in the end of the day, it looks like you're much still much better off um, eating the whole mushrooms uh, rather than these, this again, this reductionist supplement, uh, which probably doesn't work in its in that artificial form as much as it would do if you're eating the whole. So fungus. you're skeptical. Just to make sure I've got that. You're as often like skeptical with extracting the one chemical as ET. Quite bullish about the underlying mushroom. Eating the underlying mushrooms. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's definitely a healthy compound when you eat it in in in. The context of the f- whole fungus, the mushroom. Uh, once we make it industrially and commercially, and you take it outside, that the evidence isn't really clear. It, it's it's that beneficial, and that's where marketing takes over. So, I think that that's that's what I've learned. So go out and pick those, you know, seps and those porcini mushrooms, and have a you know fantastic meal, knowing that just one of the hundreds of amazing chemicals you're getting is going to be this. This ET that may have anti-cancer properties, um, you know, it it may do um, uh, have all these other benefits. But I think we're better off just by eating more mushrooms rather than these supplements. I think this touches on a, an important point as well that that many of these medicinal fungi are have been used for a really long time by uh, by traditional um, cultures and have been known about by traditional knowledge systems. It includes psychedelics as well. So um, it's easy to forget that. Um, when we are um, talking about the stories of modern science, where it can seem as if uh, we're just discovering that these things work. Uh, I think a lot of what's going on in, in, these, in these modern scientific contexts is um, that we're understanding a little bit more about how they work. Um, but, um, but that um, many of these fungal species like reishi and um, lion's mane, chaga, these have been used for a, a, a very long time. It's interesting. It makes me think of this analogy with aspirin, right? Which is from a tree, and you're going to tell me which tree it's. Willow. Bark, willow. Bark of a willow. Um, right. Where I think similarly, it was used for tra- in traditional medicine for thousands of years. This is right, and it's only then much later that we came along and understood. In this case, identified you know the individual compound and, f- and figured out how to to mass produce it. So is that the the analogy here. It's, it's definitely an analogy. So many of the medicines that are very familiar, familiar medicines in, in, in the ph- modern pharmacopoeia have come from, from folk medicines. Um, and actually with these traditional, with these more traditional um, fungal um, medicinal fungal species, uh, one of the reasons why we don't know as much as we should is because it's, it's difficult for um, 
it's very expensive to do big human clinical studies. Uh, and with these traditional medicines that we've even known about for a long time, there's not much um, IP to defend. So big companies aren't so motivated to do those studies. And it's one so of we understand the- that. No one is going to spend a billion dollars to prove that eating a particular mushroom improves your health because they can't lock up the mushroom in the way they can lock up a, a pill, which I think is very familiar to us, right, Tim, as we think about nutritional science. They just people haven't spent the money on these studies because nobody can lock up olive oil or, or whatever it is, which is actually a brilliant transition to talk about food. And um, I think that our listeners will not tune back if I haven't had a chance to talk, really interested to talk about specifically for these, um, you know, like cancer and, and mental health. But more broadly, Tim, um, as I said, I love this chapter in your book talking about why mushrooms were so valuable for us to eat. But can you give me the you know the quick rundown again? Like, why should anyone care about eating mushrooms? Well, they taste fantastic. They have this amazing range of chemicals that give you this umami taste, this savory taste, which is sort of mimicking meat in in many ways. And some people, it's it's better than meat, particularly if you've got a range of different mushrooms uh, there, and you've you've slow cooked them, and or even get more taste if you dehydrate them and rehydrate them in many cases. So you actually get even more savory flavors and more chemicals. But as well as being super tasty, you know, they are, uh, there's a lot of water in them. So once you've got rid of the water, they are, have huge amounts of protein, uh, 25% protein, pretty good amounts of fiber as well. All these chemicals we've been talking about that have a whole variety of of these effects. Uh, they're a source of selenium. They're actually a source of vitamin D. Uh, and they sunbathe like humans. And they convert- You mentioned this before. Is yeah. this really true that if you leave them out in the sun before eating, they have more vitamin D? It is. I mean, it depends slightly on the variety, but um, some of them are really good at converting natural steroids in them to vitamin D, which is a, is a steroid. And basically, you can get, uh, you know, uh, uh, half of your vitamin D amounts from from eating uh, portions of mushrooms. Is it just a lucky byproduct for us that these mushrooms are so nutritious and have all of these chemicals we don't access else elsewhere? In some sense, I mean, it's it's also important to remember that these they haven't been busily evolving for over a billion years to give us. No, vitamin D or, 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 or to... Or How to, selfish of them. <laughs> um, and um, uh, although, it, no, obviously it, it is irrelevant um, when we're talking about what it's like to eat them. Um, but they need these molecules themselves to do a lot of the basic things that they need to do. So, for example, when we use fungal drugs like penicillin, which is a very famous drug produced by a fungus, um, the fungus is producing that antibiotic to defend itself from bacteria. When we use it in our lives, we are rehousing a fungal solution within our bodies uh, and our our, um, societies. And so I think that you can think of um, a lot of the nutritional content of mushrooms as as something similar. Um, It'll be very from from compound to compound, of course. It's interesting. We talk a lot about diversity as we think about what you're eating. And in a sense, uh, what I'm hearing is like, Fungi aren't even plants, so I guess to make it very, to think about this very simple, it's hardly surprising you're getting more diversity in the same way you're describing these, these fungi carrying out tasks that plants can't do. Similarly, it's perhaps not surprising that you might have access to like these different sorts of complex chemicals from fungi that we wouldn't just get through our normal plants, or am I stretching this too far? I think there's lots of things that, that fungi can do for us chemically that plants can't. Um, because they're so chemically ingenious, because they produce all these different compounds to do all these different things. Um, And um, in fact, lots of the chemicals that you'll get by eating a plant have originally been um, concentrated or or even made by a fungus. Um, Much of the phosphorus that's in your body would have passed through a fungus on its way to the plant that that, that fed you. And is it okay to eat them raw or should I always be cooking my mushrooms? Um, Unless you're very careful, you're better off I think, uh, cooking them. Um, there are quite a few poisonous types and there are other ones that uh, just by cooking them, you, you get rid of those uh, na- nasty chemicals and they're easier to eat. And it's often easier to get the nu- nutrients from them if they're slightly cooked as well because they have this special um, layer, uh, chitin, um, uh, which is very hard to break down. 
and gives it that, that structure. And also they're full of water as well. So if you're cooking them, you, you actually get rid of a lot of the water and uh, you get actually more flavors that way. So that's, that's my view. I don't know whether you eat lots of raw mushrooms, but um, I think they taste better uh, cooked generally. And so that's the way I Easier to digest. digest. They're breaking down the cell walls um, for sure. Um, the times when I might eat them um, that when they haven't been cooked, firm, formally cooked with heat, is um, when they've been fermented. So if you're eating like a, a mold like koji, which is used to make soy sauce and miso, um, you haven't cooked that, but it has been transformed through a fermentation process. Cold cooking, yeah, we call cooking. that. So yes, no, I've started fermenting mushrooms. It's quite tricky, but uh, they do taste amazing. And, and how do you access this? Because most people will feel like if they go to their local grocery store or mushrooms, maybe there's like one type of mushroom or, you know, I think we start to see a few more, but still not very many. And I at least have been told by my mother, again, I feel like there's a long list of things that my mother told me not to do on this podcast, but one of them was not to eat random mushrooms that you find like, in the forest because you're likely to kill yourself. So how do people, I assume that the not eating random mushrooms is a good idea, Merlin? It's definitely a good idea. Because quite a lot of them eat. are genuinely poisonous. So there are some poisonous mushrooms which will give you a really uh, a bad time and potentially kill you. So um, the general uh, rule of thumb is that you never eat a mushroom that you've found unless you can positively identify it. What that means is that um, you're not just saying, well, it's not that, and it's not that, so it must be this. What you're saying is, I know for a fact that it's this. Um, so that's Which is a high bar for most people listening to this, yeah, but, just but, wandering into their local park and but, seeing a mushroom. But there are lots of ways to, to learn about you know, what mushrooms are which. It's like you can learn about what trees are which or what birds are which. And, and, and um, it's actually a really exciting thing for, for many people to do. And, so, and there's lots of uh, great resources online um, for those who want to learn more. So I wouldn't discourage anyone for, from doing that. It's not like you need to become like the expert who knows all mushrooms overnight. I think there are thir about 300 edible types of mushroom I, uh, I read somewhere, and but about 30 are cultivated. And they're the ones you'd see in the shops. Uh, so up to 30, I guess, is the, is the most you're going to see in, in, probably in this country. And most of us aren't going to see 30. They're maybe going to see a few. So that brings me back to the question at the, be at the beginning about you know, dried mushrooms and you know, are they still good for your health or does it need to be fresh in the way that I think you talk about a lot of other plants. You say if they just sit out there for months, there's not much you know, yes. left in them. I was surprised when I was reading this that there are studies looking at the nutritional content of, of dried mushrooms. And I think a lot of it's done on shiitake mushrooms, uh, but porcini as well, which the Italians often store dried. And they are just as nutritious, just uh, they've looked at the chemical composition and uh, are super healthy. And, and some people have, they think they have more taste when they're rehydrated. You have to add water back into them, usually warm water. And so these seem to be to very, very healthy. So it's a bit like our stories about canned tomatoes or um, beans, some of these things which you might think are not healthy because they're dried, you know, are actually, actually still really good preserved. for you. And uh, I think it shouldn't stop people eating mushrooms out of season by eating these dried ones. I think that's the message. Um, although you should find a reputable source because it's sometimes when dried mushrooms are imported, um, you can't tell you, by looking at the fragments of dried mushrooms so you can't confirm just visually that it's the species it says it is. And there are cases of um, contamination or um, the wrong kind of mushroom ending up in your bag of dried mushrooms. So you're not really getting the variety that you want or the or the diversity. They're just giving you a bunch yeah, of the or, or cheapest or, ones. Yeah, or, or there are a few thrown in with the ones you want and those might not be the ones you want to be eating. So um, reputable source. But button mushrooms are the sort of common ones in the UK and they're often the cheapest and they're cultivated in, in large amounts. And uh, although they look fairly dull compared to some of the exotic ones you see, I think they've still got plenty of nutrients in Is that them. right? Because they, they, they sort of look like the white bread of mushrooms, but you're telling me that actually they still... Well, it, it's all I feel like they can't have any nutritional value whatsoever, but you're telling me that actually I'm being unfair? I think you are, yes. Uh, certainly, I apologize you know, to the there may be better ones in my life. But you might be, you'll be generally paying more for uh, the better ones. But Berlin probably knows the differences between all of the uh, the varieties. But I still think there's no such thing as a bad mushroom. I think that's my, my I'd agree point. with that. I'd agree with that. I, I personally think there are ones that taste a lot better and, and, and are more and more available, actually, like oyster mushrooms or shiitake mushrooms, um, which I would always choose over a button mushroom. Um, I would agree that there's no such thing as a bad edible mushroom. 
Um, but um, for those that don't like uh, or have not liked as a child, for example, button mushrooms, there may well be mushrooms out there that you do like um, because there's quite a range of flavors and textures. That's a bit like saying, so you can't give up on all mushrooms um, because you had a bad one. It's a bit like saying you're giving up on all plants because you don't like artichokes or something. Exactly. You'd be like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, try a tomato. That's fascinating. And presumably, Tim, because we talk a lot with um, Sarah about this idea of like the food matrix and complexity. Am I right in suspecting that a ground powdered mushroom is not likely to be as good as one of these dried but still sort of um, sort of whole mushroom or I think it depends how much it's it's been crushed if you like uh, so I'd like to see something that you know still resembles a mushroom in some way so it's not a fine chemical powder it hasn't been reduced to those few chemicals we've talked about it still has some of the complexity of all the things going in there it hasn't been fiddled with too much but if we take you know just pure fast drying uh, a whole mushroom, getting rid of all that water. And then if as long as you grind it up and it's not too fine a dust, I think you're still getting most of those components. Because there are some studies showing that actually the, the cell walls of, of these fungi can have some benefits as well on health. And that was, I thought that was really interesting on the immune system. So you don't want to get rid of those. You still want to keep some of that structure. So it's I the think, story we always keep coming back to, isn't yeah. it? Which is like you extract a few chemicals as people do and they want to make famous and you lose like the 9,000 other that are actually contributing to the, to the overall You benefit. lose the fiber, the structure and things that you're throwing away a lot of the, most of the good stuff. But I would also add that um, there are situations when you're taking a medicinal mushroom, um, for example, where... Um, you might want to concentrate it because you simply wouldn't get enough of those active fractions um, if you, I mean, it would take, you'd, you'd have to eat so many mushrooms to get those, those active fractions that, that you might never get to that, to that point. So I think there are cases where you might want to take an extract alongside um, your diet of whole mushrooms. That makes lots of sense. So this question came up uh, a lot with people emailing into us. How often should people be eating mushrooms? I would say try and get some mushrooms in every day if you can, uh, and if you know at least three times a week. Uh, most of the studies uh, done for preventing cancer, etc., have done at least two cupfuls a day. So I think uh, if you're if you're really trying to make a big difference to your health, uh, the more you get, the better. And try and vary the uh, species as well. I think that's the other thing because we don't know yet what the particular advantages are. So as for plants, diversity, I think, is is going to turn out to be key. So this is something, you know, this is a very new field, but I think going for a diverse range of mushrooms, trying to pick some new ones, you know, even if it's small amounts, um, go for it. And, we, you know, there is, uh, you know, there are these mushroom teas and mushroom coffees, generally they have very small amounts of actual mushroom in them. So... Don't be fooled into thinking that's really the same as having a, a full mushroom meal. But I think that's that's the other takeaway. So before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you both this sort of final question. What's your favorite way of eating mushrooms and what mushrooms would be in there? I love a uh, creamy mushroom tagliatelle. It's mine using, if I can get three different types of mushroom, and uh, I fry them up, get rid of the water, add garlic and some uh, creme fraiche, maybe with a bit of uh, kefir just to, at the end to give it a bit more microbial time. Mix it with my fresh pasta. That's one of my favorite meals. Sounds delicious. And what are the mushrooms? Uh, well, it's whatever I can get, really. I, I, you know, I don't think you should be too fussy uh, what you can get. Um, so I... You know, I, I like shiitake mushrooms, uh, porcini, you know, the seps variety. Um, but I, I always like trying something new, actually. That's, you know, so they've all got different textures and things. And uh, But I haven't found one I don't like yet. Merlin. I often just saute them, just fry them lightly in a pan, get some of the water out and, um, and eat them like that, maybe on toast or just by themselves. Um, but also I love making soups. Um and a soup might I'd probably have a miso base in the soup. I, I might add some um, some kefir to give it some creaminess. Um, 
But uh, and I throw in as many different species as I could get into the soup, and, and the way the flavors um, can um, meld together in a soup form is is something I really enjoy. Um, in terms of species, um, of the cultivated varieties, the varieties you could buy um, at a shop that had a good selection all year round, shiitakes, inoki, which are kind of white tufts uh, of mushrooms with thin, slender, um, slender stalks, um, maitake, I love. Um, oyster mushrooms are great. Um, and if they're talking about wild species, then um, it's um, whatever is around. Um, but um, there are various, various favorites. I just was in France eating porcini, which were fantastic, uh, and, and mountains of chanterelles, which I also really enjoy. If someone's listening to this and now they're really interested in saying, okay, like I can get a certain amount in the shops and maybe I can get some more that are dried, but I'm really excited about all these wild ones that aren't, don't even exist but I don't want to poison myself. How could they get started? There are great websites uh, and field guides, books. Um, which field guide you get, which website you visit will depend on where in the world you are. Um, so it's important to find uh, somewhere that's talking about the relevant fungi. Um, and um, there's a great app called iNaturalist, which is also a, um, a good resource. Brilliant. Well, we'll talk to Merlin to see if we can get a few of those links. We'll put them in the show notes. And I know you mentioned um, actually just beforehand that like in, in a country as big as the States, for example, like the West Coast mushrooms and the East Coast mushrooms are really quite different. So you would need to have a different guide. Well, there'll be, there'll be common mushrooms, but, but they're quite different ecosystems. So, um, so you might be better off with a, a local guide which has fewer species in it than the big one that has all of them in. Um, it might be an easy place to begin. Brilliant. Thank you both very much. Um, Merlin, I would like to try and do a quick summary. And um, both you and Tim, please correct me if I've got um, any of this wrong. So we start off by just saying, like, what is fungi? And amazingly, it is a kingdom, which I love because it's not a word that we, uh, we use very often. Um, it's a kingdom of life. So it's as big as plants or animals, but it's its own thing. And turns out it's lived, I think you said, for 500 million years, like in this life with plants where they've grown together and where until we invented these modern agricultural chemicals over the last 100 years, it was sort of essential for feeding the plants that, um, that we all ate. We've done a lot of damage to fungi with modern agriculture, um, probably without really being aware of it originally. Um, and this is likely to affect that the plant, the plants we eat. So historically, the plants we ate would have been in these deep relationships with the fungi, and there would have been all these chemicals. Now we sort of feed them with these fertilizers. They, they're sort of much simpler as a result. And we talked about this have been a little bit like sort of ultra processed food for for plants, which we now know is not very good for people. Um, soil, therefore, historically, is absolutely full of life. Um, and today, in a lot of the places where uh, we are doing this intensive agriculture, there's a lot less of it. So there has been this sort of profound um, breakdown. Why does this matter? It matters because we think this affects the food that we eat as well as affecting the ecosystem around us. We then talked quite a lot about mushrooms, which I, I discovered are like the fruit of the fungi. Firstly, talking about medicine, um, and there's lots of places in which it's been investigated. It sounds as though around areas of um, mental health. Tim was quite skeptical about ET supplements, which are not a way to get into a movie, but apparently are the latest um, rage. But I think, Tim, you said once, once again, you're very skeptical about something, which is one chemical that's been extracted from these mushrooms and therefore leaving behind, you know, maybe hundreds or thousands of, of others. And then we talked about mushrooms for eating. Both of you are incredibly positive, starting off with they tasting great, and therefore they should just be part of um, uh, what we do but also because they have all of these complex chemicals. And for the same reasons that fungi extract all of these chemicals that plants can't, there's a high chance that we're going to access a set of chemicals that are probably not in our regular diet. So again, creating more diversity, which is something that um, we talk about a lot on, on these podcasts. Often better if slightly cooked, which is the reverse sometimes of what we um, hear. It makes me pleased because I definitely prefer them that way. Even the humble button mushroom is just fine, and that um, I should not have been so prejudiced. Uh, though I heard um, Merlin definitely say oyster or shiitake were probably his preferences in taste. But above all, there's no such thing as a bad mushroom. And really what you should be looking for is just like with plants, like diversity of them, trying different mushrooms. 
There are a limited number that are cultivated. I think you said there are about 30. I think I'd be lucky to find more than four in my uh, local grocery store. So there's, a, there's an issue about access. But the good news is actually dried mushrooms might be even better than fresh. So there is a way to do that. If you really want to go and access all the others, then you're going to have to figure out how to do it for yourself. And we'll put some links in um, in the show notes for those of you who are interested. But do be aware that some of them are poisonous. So you need to make sure you really know what you're doing. And also, um, if everyone goes out and picks the mushrooms in their parks and in the surrounding countryside, um, there won't be many mushrooms left. So um, foraging isn't really a, um, a sustainable way to feed a population at, at the moment. Um, so, so if you were going to go out and look for mushrooms, if you found some edible mushrooms that you were convinced were edible mushrooms, you knew were edible mushrooms, you might take a few of them to eat and leave um, most of them behind. Brilliant. Thank you both very much. Once again, I started, but I'm going to finish at the same time saying you have to look at the photos in this book. I think they will really blow your mind in the same way for me as like first listening to Tim talking about the microbiome being inside us and how much that shapes you. I think it's, um, I'm definitely not going to look at um, a plant in the same way as I did before. You realize that there's something really magical going on sort of under the soil. So I, uh, I couldn't recommend it more. Merlin, thank you so much for coming in. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tim, as always, thank you so much for guiding us through this. It's been fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Merlin and Tim, for joining me on Zoe Science and Nutrition today. It's been fascinating to hear about the incredible impact that fungi have on our planet and can have on our health. Now, if after listening to this, you're hungry for more science-backed nutrition and health insights, why not download our brand new guide, which captures 10 of the most impactful discoveries from the podcast so far. You can download it for free by going to zoe.com slash podcast, and you can also learn more about Zoe. You'll also find the link in the show notes. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Wolf. Zoe Science and Nutrition is produced by Yella Hewins-Martin, Richard Willen, and Tilly Fulford. See you next time.